Hello, this is Justin Williams with the Wolfpacker Podcast. I'm joined today, as always, by co-host Matt Carter, and we are going to break down the 86-76 to NC State road loss to North Carolina on Saturday, January 23rd. Before we get too far into this podcast episode, this podcast is brought to you in part by JFQ Lending. With interest rates below 3%, there has never been a better time to lock in a low fixed interest rate on your mortgage. You'll never need to think about refinancing again. Set it and forget it. And with JFQ Lending, you are guaranteed to get the highest level of customer service. They have an A-plus rating with the Better Business Bureau and over 3,000 five-star reviews. Give Hunter Clawson a call today at 480-513-3992 or email Hunter directly at hclawson at jfqlending.com. That's H-C-L-A-U-S-S-E-N at jfqlending.com. JFQ Lending, Inc., Equal Access Lender, licensed in over 40 states, www.jfqlending.com. And while you're at it, head over to thewolfpacker.com and use promo code PAC60. That's promo code PAC60 for a free six-day trial on all of our premium content news and analysis on thewolfpacker.com. You can also join the conversation in the message boards and whether it's an NC State win or an NC State loss, you can join the conversation with your fellow Pack fans and uh, talk about what you liked, what you didn't like from the game. And uh, before you know it, or while you're at it, please be sure to subscribe, rate, and review this podcast wherever you listen to us. We're on Apple Podcast app, Spotify, Google Play. You are also might be watching this on YouTube. So if you're on YouTube, please give us a subscribe to our YouTube channel. We've got post-game uh, interviews with the players and coaches after every game, plus we've got these post-game reflections podcast after every football and basketball game, so give us a subscribe. We've got plenty of great stuff coming up on our YouTube channel as well. All right, Matt, let's talk about NC State's loss Saturday. It was a game that, in our game predictions on Friday, we both predicted a Wolfpack loss, um, just considering the unknowns of whether or not Manny Bates was going to play, what NC State was going to look like after a 10-day pause after a few COVID cases impacted the program and caused a couple postponed games. NC State lost a Saturday matchup with Georgia Tech a week that was supposed to be played a week ago and then um, also had a game postponed when they were supposed to go up to Charlottesville to take on the Virginia Cavaliers. But NC State jumped right back into the action against rival North Carolina in the second game of the season series, NC State won the first one in Raleigh 79-76, but North Carolina was able to get its revenge Saturday in the Dean Dome. You were there in the empty Dean Dome, Matt, so maybe have some fresh intel or maybe some things you saw from the game um, that maybe weren't caught on TV, but, um, but NC State comes away with its fourth loss in a row. They have yet to win a game in January and now sit at 2-4 and four in ACC play, um, looking for a win here in January. So, you know, all in all, I thought NC State competed for 40 minutes. We were talking right before this podcast started that, you know, other than that 10-2 to two run that Carolina had in the last four minutes of the first half, all in all, it's a pretty even game between two teams that seem to be rather evenly matched when you look at the talent of both teams. Now, granted, NC State probably has a little bit more talent in its backcourt, a little bit more depth, and, of course, North Carolina has the same in its front court with four of its bigs that are 6'10 or taller, and ultimately that was advantage North Carolina this afternoon. Uh, Carolina was able to outscore the pack 48-40 to in the paint, out-rebounded on the offensive glass 14-7, to uh, outscored the pack by six points on second chance opportunities. So, Matt, what do you make of this 10 point loss for the Wolf Pack? Um, you know, granted, it's 10 days removed from a 32 point shellacking in Tallahassee that was, um, you know, just a soul crushing type of loss for an NC State team that was looking to pick up some momentum in January. I thought they showed a lot more fight in Chapel Hill than they did in Tallahassee 10 days ago, but ultimately come up short and aren't able to get the first uh, season sweep, if you will, since 2003. They had a rare opportunity to do so in Chapel Hill this afternoon, just weren't able to close it out. So, Matt, what were, what'd you see um, from your viewpoint in the Dean Dome, and, and what do you make of this 10-point loss? Well, I 
there's a, a lot, but it, and also uh, it's, it's I'm 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 mad about it. He just didn't guard. I second great game, but he just didn't guard. Um, you know, I know Devin Daniels said it was an effort issue. It's something going on on defense. It's just not a UNC team that you should be giving up 54% field goal percentage shooting to. Um, and that came after a game where you gave up 70%. You know, and that that's never really an excusable. I mean, I know you can say, ah, oh, Florida State just didn't miss. They shot the lights. Uh, Kevin Keats used a much more, uh, much more descriptive word to describe how Florida State shot. You could use that, but the reality is that they're not going to shoot like that if you're guarding them. Um, and they haven't been guarding them. And I think, to me, the last two games, at some point you got to re-examine things on defense. They're not really pressing. Uh, and the biggest takeaway I have is I don't know what NC State's identity is right now. You know, when they were doing well, when they were 6-1, and, and, and then they lose in overtime to Clemson, the identity was getting turnovers and shooting threes pretty well. They got guys, and one of the questions asked in the post game was guys passing up open threes. There were a lot of good looks at threes they passed up. They're not pressing and they're not getting turnovers. Um, and so basically they're just trying to play like a half court man to man defense and it isn't working. And part of that is the matchup. NC State's not a long team. Manny Bates is probably an exception to that. And Darion C. Braun seems to have fallen out apparently in practice because he's not playing in games. So there's not a lot of length on defense. Um, but I, I remember thinking to myself at one point in the game, why not try a zone defense here? Why not try a 2-3 zone? They're killing them inside with Baycott. And the big, one of the big differences with Dayron Sharp was a lot better this game than he was last game. So why not break out his zone defense? Uh, see what happens. I'm sure they don't practice it that much, but um, you had to try something. You cannot get back into a game if you don't get stops, extended periods of stops. And that hadn't happened the last two games. And the offense has been fine. You told me NC State scored 76 points. At the beginning of the day, at the beginning of the day, I would have thought that this was a game that, at the minimum, came down to the wire at the end. Uh, North, it's not a North Carolina team yet that has shown that they're built to be scoring 86 points in a game. Um, so, I, I think there's a long look that needs to be taken. Look at defense and kind of even a look of uh, what do we want to be this year? Do we, what are we going to? What's our identity going to be? Um, you know, we. Saw another different starting lineup today. Shaquille Moore looked like he fell out of the rotation today. Hmm. You know, just, and, and it's hard to have that continuity that Kevin Keith brought up. It's a very good point. I know some more says this excuse, but when you're not practicing, it's hard to kind of get your, you know, the rhythm and, and, and you know, it, probably feel like you're having to start over a little bit and and i'm sure that played a big role into it look carolina has not had a pause this year in basketball um so there was an advantage that the heroes had there but you know that's my takeaway i gotta figure something out on defense you can't be giving up 70 percent for sure but really you shouldn't be giving up 54 percent shooting and i think only 13 turnovers to unc either well, you hit on some good points there. Um, one one really thing that jumped off the stat page when I was looking at the final box score was, you know, only four four minutes for Shaquille Moore, zero minutes, and I don't think he played in the second half. Um, now, granted, you know, Coach Keats talked about after the game that that was due to, you know, Shaquille Moore just not playing well in practice leading up to this game. Keats has a philosophy where, He's going to base players' playing time based on their performances in practice, and you know that's I wasn't there in practice. Com, you know, could be completely understandable based on how he played, but you know, for a team that wants to run an up-tempo system that you know wants to press, even though they haven't necessarily been pressing too much as of recently, you know, this was supposed to be a team that Coach Keats was going to have his most depth in his four years in Raleigh so far. I mean, you look at the minutes distribution. Um, 
of the entire roster. I mean, technically they went nine deep, but in terms of considerable minutes, I mean, you're looking at six guys that played 23 minutes or more. Uh, Cam Hayes played 16 minutes, only scored two points, was minus eight in efficiency, so, you know, not really much of a contribution there from from him and your other freshman guard, Shaquille Moore. Darian Sebron didn't even get into the game. Uh, Jalen Gibson played a couple minutes, but all in all, it was pretty much Bates coming off the bench in the starting five, um, which he went with a little bit more experience in this game. Beverly got the start again at point guard, and that was you know one of the one of the promising things of today is that Braxton Beverly looked as good as he's looked really since the first meeting between these two programs. Um, I think he's made he made one three since the last time. Um, NC State played Carolina on December 22nd. He makes two today. He becomes the fifth player in program history to have 200 made three-pointers. So, you know, maybe something there for NC State to build on, Braxton Beverly's performance. He went 2-4 from three-point land and 5-10 of from the field. Um, had the third most. some steals in this game. Man. He, he had five steals. That's a yeah. lot. That's a lot. Um, and, you know, uh, Manny Bates, he was a question mark going into this game. I thought Manny Bates played a really great game. Uh, 10 points in 30 minutes, 5 of 6 from the field, very efficient, 7 blocks. I mean, he was just a block machine. He tied Cedric Simmons's program record for most blocks in a single contest against an ACC opponent. That was in 2005. So Manny Bates getting another mark in the, in the record books this afternoon. But, you know, it was kind of odd because – you know, you get a good performance out of Devin Daniels, 21 points. He led the Wolfpack in scoring, 9 of 16 from the field, 3 of 5 from 3. He was the most uh, efficient three-point shooter for the Wolfpack tonight. Um, but, you know, you get a good game from Devin Daniels. You get good performances from the two guys that were maybe question marks entering this game with Braxton Beverly and, and Manny Bates. But, you know, other than that, I don't think, um, you know, DJ Funderburk was – kind of non-existent in that first half. He had a strong second half, finished with 14 points and just four rebounds. You probably want to see more boards from him. Maybe would have helped the the rebounding margin in this game. But, you know, when it came down to it, Carolina was just able to control the boards, particularly on the offensive glass. And I think that was the main difference between this game and the December meeting in PNC Arena. You know, we talked about entering that game that NC State – NC State's never going to out-rebound a Carolina team that has this kind of size and depth in the front court. But if they can keep it close, they can they can, you know, keep it competitive and, and you know, come out with a win like they did in December. Carolina shot the ball a lot better um, in the Dean Dome this time around. Uh, but, you know, for a Carolina team that was shooting just over 42% from the field on the year, they shot 54% from the field today. 36% from three, four of 11 from the perimeter. They didn't make a lot of free throws, which was an opportunity for the Wolfpack to pounce on. But when you can't get stops, particularly down low, it's just uh, it's just tough to win a game. So um, is, is Carolina just a bad match? I mean, you look at these last two games and you can get discouraged, you know, looking at the 32-point loss to Florida State, the 10-point loss to Carolina. But – you look across the ACC and you look at this NC State team, you know, roster makeup wise, UNC and Florida State might be the two, you know, mismatches in the conference in terms of just their size and length and their style of play compared to the way NC State plays. I mean, is there is there reason for optimism moving forward as NC State moves into this late January to, to February stretch here and and the schedule seems to lighten up a little bit, but then again, it's the ACC, and there's really no nights off. Yeah, I mean, you can't say there's reason for optimism until you actually see a good result. Um, the reason for optimism, I guess, would be you're getting Wake Forest to, as uh, we're recording this, was playing Pittsburgh on Saturday night, and I believe they were down. So. Uh, Wake Forest team had not won an ACC game, which was expected to be at the bottom of the ACC this year. So there is an opportunity for kind of a get-right moment, and you're going back to practicing full squad, which you hadn't had in a long – even before COVID. I mean, you got to remember Beverly was hurt, uh, had not been practicing as much, and Bates got hurt and had missed some practices. Um, but so you just hadn't had a lot of continuity with the full squad – 
Uh, they've had some adversity. You have to be honest. They have had some adversity um, that makes it hard. And you mentioned UNC controlling the rebounds, you know, and that's, as you mentioned, that's to be expected. Um, they're going to do that to nine out of ten teams they play. Um, I always say, you know, kind of laugh and fans say, oh, why didn't, you know, NC State could play Alabama in football and give up 50-some points and everybody would be whipping the defense for how they played. And I would say, you know, Alabama did that to everybody, right? That's just what they do. Well, UNC is going to do that to just about everybody. What Roy Williams' team do? And this is one of the biggest Roy Williams' teams that he had. Uh, I think the big difference this game with Daywan Sharp was a big difference this time where he wasn't last time. Interestingly, Garrison Brooks is going to hate NC State this year. Uh, he had two really bad games against NC State this year, the ACC preseason play of the year. Um, I don't know if there's ever been an ACC preseason play of the year that did not make all ACC, but uh, that might happen. Uh, and look, uh, uh, Love, Caleb Love was a much different player this time around anywhere at the last time around. But, yeah, this, uh, so it is a tough matchup. You're right. Florida State was a tough matchup. And you throw into that Florida State, apparently, you cannot convince me they hadn't been practicing while they were on there because they have come out of that pause on fire. And they look like one of the best teams in the country. Um, yeah, but there's some things that they just got to get back to the basics on defense. You know, this game was basically really decided by that 10-2 run that we talked about. You go back and look. I believe it was they just scored to go up 35-31. State missed the shot. I believe Thunderbird missed three straight shots during that stretch. And on the other end of the court, I believe it was uh, Walton for UNC missed a three-pointer. It was one of those halfway down popped out three-pointers. And you can see Daywan Sharp from the top of the key come down and he gets the rebound and dunks it in. You know, a slam follow, two-handed. You go back, and I'm not picking on DJ Funder, but because there were a lot of times there were defensive failures all over the court. You go back and watch the replay. Funderburg is fundamentally just didn't box out Dayron Sharp and gave him a free, almost a free run, a free lane right to the rim. And when the rebound comes off right off of the rim, that was an easy two points. And that's when you, as you mentioned, you know that. Uh, stops against UNC is going to be a premium because of their ability to offensive rebound. Um, when you're letting them shoot 54% and getting offensive rebound, that's a double whammy. And you just, you need stops. Um, but yeah, I still think this team can be good. I've seen many, I told you beforehand, I've seen many of uh, NC State teams seem to hit their stride in February. You know, Godfrey's second team that went to the Sweet 16. You know, they looked dead in the water at one point in January and they really reeled off some nice wins. Um, I remember a Hope's Index team that went to the Sweet 16 looked like they were dead in the water. I think they were like 12 and 8 or something like that overall record. And then they went on a nice roll in February and, and got to the Sweet 16. So I think, you know, it, it's still early. You're talking. Yeah, it comes a point though where you're gonna start watching, and you, you probably can't afford to have any more slip-ups, a la Miami at home, and you need to start taking advantage of some of these opportunities. You know, you let a good one slip away on the road against Clemson. That one stands out. There, there are gonna be some other opportunities. You got road games, I think, against Syracuse and Pittsburgh, and I believe in. Uh, I think they're playing Duke on the road, but Duke's at home. At home, yeah, mm -hmm. but they're not highly ranked. So um, we'll have to see what they do with some of these postponed games. You get Virginia at home, so you know the optimism would be there's still opportunities. I think what was partially what we're seeing are freshmen are hitting the wall. That's to be expected to. These were not top 25 freshmen. Um, these were top 75, top 100 freshmen. Um, and the three that have been primarily playing look like they've hit a little bit of a wall. That's to be expected. So the onus is going to be on the older guys to really pick up their games 
why the freshmen get through that. Because usually they come through the other side of the wall and kind of get a second wind. Mm -hmm. That's kind of what you got to hope for. Yeah, you're, it was almost like you were reading my mind because it's games like this where, you know, if you're NC State, you look back and you really kick yourself for letting it slip in Little John Coliseum, you know, two, three weeks ago uh, against Clemson in a game you led for 36 minutes. And then ultimately just some late turnovers and offensive droughts lead to an overtime loss against a then-ranked team. or was I don't know if they were ranked at the time, but they became ranked shortly after. Now Clemson's slipping, and that loss no longer is looking like a quality loss rather than a you know a loss to a team that's probably about on par as you. And then Miami, you know, an offensive lackluster performance. Um, had opportunities late in that game and just can't close out at home against the team that was still looking to find its first conference win. Um, and then you fix the offense in these last two games, but – you let up 105 points and then uh, 10 days ago, and you let up 86 points to Carolina, a team that's had a ton of offensive struggles this season. I mean, look, they they grab a lot of offensive rebounds, but even when they get those rebounds, they don't necessarily follow it up with second chance points. I mean, this is a team that was dead last in the ACC in two point field goal percentage entering this contest. So. A lot of questions on the defensive side of the ball. I mean, there's a lot of strong defensive pieces too. Manny Bates is, I mean, arguably the best defensive center in the conference. Shaquille Moore, we all know he's an incredible on-ball defender. Only played four minutes tonight. Maybe could have you know, been a little bit more helpful on the court had he gotten some more time, but we'll see. You know, Thomas Allen's a guy that can get steals. Braxton Beverly's a guy that can go out, go out and get you five steals in any given game. I know he you know, struggles guarding the perimeter at times. You know, guys can use their size to get around him or use their quickness to get around him. But um, you know, you've got strong defensive pieces. It just seems like the communication isn't there. Um, the enthusiasm, as Devin Daniels put it, in his post-game availability wasn't there. So you know, we'll, we'll really find out the grit of this NC State team in the next week to 10 days here. Um, we'll see how they respond against Wake Forest team that's hungry. And by the way, Matt, Wake Forest has a nine-point lead as we're recording this podcast uh, against Pittsburgh at 7.40 p.m. on Saturday. So it looks like the Demon Deacons could be entering Wednesday's contest with their first ACC win. Their team that's a that, good thing, though, right? Isn't it, that a good thing? For maybe, if, I, would say, I would say so. I would say it's probably good for them to go ahead and get that ACC win out of the way because you know, clearly going in against a team that – is still searching for its first ACC win, wasn't a recipe for success against Miami. So, you know, and, and credit Wake Forest, they've been competing really hard this year. They've had some really close games with good good teams. They just haven't found ways to win. Um, so, that you know, that's not an easy out. That, that That's a game, that, I mean, NC State, as capable as they are of winning every game on their schedule, they're just as capable of losing every game. So... We'll see how the Wolfpack comes back and, and performs against the Demon Deacons next week. One last thing before we give out our game balls. thought it was another thing that jumped out to me on the box score. Entering this game, Thomas Allen was on fire. He was by far NC State's best perimeter shooting threat over the past couple weeks. He led the pack in scoring against Florida State and um, Miami before that. In those two games, he shot 8 of 10 from the three-point line. 80%, that, I mean, not a sustainable rate, but with those type of numbers, you want to see him get more looks. You want to see him take more shots from three. And I thought he had some really, really great looks in this game Saturday. He had, I mean, I can think of three right off the top of my head in the first half where he just was wide open from the corner, just couldn't get a shot to drop. Just wasn't his night. I think he finishes with two points. Um, but, you know, it just it just seems like, in this month of January, as soon as NC State figures out one problem, another problem pops up. It's like Coach Keats is playing whack-a-mole right now. It's like, you you know, you didn't get the perimeter shooting presence from Braxton Beverly all month. Then he shows up in Chapel Hill, but Th Thomas Allen can't make a three. Or uh, you don't have Manny Bates, um, you know, healthy for a few games stretch, and you get some good performance out of DJ Funderburk, and then you get Bates back healthy. He blocks seven shots, 
he's a presence on offense and gets some boards and, and DJ Funderburk disappears for the first half. So um, just going to be interesting to see if NC State can piece all these things together. I think getting back to practice with their full personnel will help matters. I mean, I, I'm not one to, to say that, you know, the pause in practice is, is not an excuse. I, I think it does tremendously impact teams. Um, but at the end of the day, you just – you have to find ways around those things as long as you're still competing. Um, so, you know, what what would be one thing to look for, um, Matt, in the next week to ten days in this next three or four-game stretch for the Wolfpack? You know, games that are winnable, games that are going to be tough, but winnable games ahead for NC State. What are you looking for specifically um, that needs to improve moving forward if NC State wants to have a chance to uh, to get into the NCAA tournament in March. I think it's still going to put any defense. I mean, I really <laughs> – yeah, you, the offense has been fine. I mean, you're scoring 70-plus points a game against ACC team against good, uh, long ACC teams that can play defense, particularly Florida State. You know, Leonard Hamilton, read his post-game comments. He was quite angry with it. You know, for the guy who won thirty by thirty plus points and shot seventy percent from the field, he was he was angry at the defense. You know, he felt like they gave up too many threes and et cetera. Um, I would argue that part of that is a product of your your team knows they're up by thirty points, right? Um, so, but you know, you can't win the game giving up a hundred plus points and nearly ninety points. That's just the bottom line. Um, so field goal percentage deep. It's really simple to me. Get stopped. You have to start getting some stops on defense. Got to go and get yourself your nice 14 to two run. Something of that nature. Um, I think it's in them. They were playing pretty decent defense up until Florida State. Did. Not great defense, but pretty decent defense. And they were turning people over. To, they're never going to be a high in, t- in the rankings of field goal percentage defense. That's just not how Kevin Keese's defense is designed. But it's offset by getting steals and turnovers, et cetera. Um, they need, just need to get back to that. They need to get – teams need to be shooting low to mid-40s like they were when NC State was playing well versus 70 and 54%. Well, is it too, is it too early to uh, put the must-win tag on Wednesday night, Matt? I don't think m- much wins really come in until February for me. Uh, I, I say this as a guy who loved bracketology, but this year is so weird. Mm-hmm. Um, but all the rules are out the books this year, but there have been plenty of teams to get hot in February and turn, in, and turn things around. There are a lot of games to be played, potentially. Um, but I would say what this – if it's not a must win, it certainly should be a heck of a lot of urgency because you've lost four games in a row. And to me, that's the most. You really can't be get, looking at five, six, seven, eight game losing streaks because uh, then things can get out of control and hard to get back from. So, uh, it depends on how you're looking at it from a must win of, oh, they don't win this, you can forget about March. No, I don't believe that. But maybe a must win in terms of if you really kind of want to. Stop the bleeding now at the time. I would call it a I not from an NCAA tournament resume perspective, but I think it's a must win in terms of the confidence of this team moving forward. You gotta win this next one to get the confidence to maybe steal some games moving forward. Can you steal a game at home against a Virginia team that looks like it's trending towards the top of the league, you know, along with Florida State right now? Can can you steal a game up in the Carrier Dome against Syracuse coming up? Um, that would be a quad one win, the first of the season for the Wolfpack. So we will see. A reminder to please subscribe, rate, and review this podcast wherever you listen to us, Apple Podcasts, Spotify, Google Play, or you can subscribe to us on our YouTube channel and watch this live, um, see our pretty faces as we talk about the pack. Um, but a quick reminder to subscribe, rate, and review wherever you listen to us or watch us. Let's give out our game balls, Matt. I'll let you go first, as always. I do think, you know, granted, it's a loss, but I do think there are a lot of options for game balls today. 
Yeah, you know, I, I'm a halfway hesitant to give it to Braxton Beverly, but I'm going to give it. The three turnovers he had were a team high, and I, I think there was some, and, you know, I don't know what he tried on that one shot where I think it looked like he was trying to beat the shot clock and kind of threw up a runner. I didn't have a good angle, so in the Dean Dome, we were sitting up a deck, and it was literally looking right down at that basket. All I saw was it looked like the basketball went over the backboard. It did. It did. On the shot. Um, Fair, fairness not, to Beverly, though. I think it was Dayron Sharp that was closing out on him. That's a, that's a foot difference right there. I guess, yeah. Would you better to just go ahead and get your shot blocked rather than shooting it over the backboard, though? I don't know. Would you rather have your shot blocked? I mean, he's used to it, right? I don't know. I mean, that, I, to me, that's not the culprit. But to, to me, the turnovers weren't the uh, – all in all, I mean, but, I think you could say the pack yeah, took care of the ball. But. Yeah, I give him my game ball. I was impressed with the defense. He really competed, which is something I felt like in the last couple of games. They were picking on him defensively, and he wasn't competing like I You know, Beverly's never going to be a world-class defender, but he normally competes. And that's different from some other guys at NC State recently who weren't good defenders because that was because they weren't even really trying. Beverly tried. Um, and he really tried today. And to get five steals, and some of them were time. I think he clean stripped one guy. Um, twice had steals and layups. And as you mentioned, made two or four or three points, finished with 12 points, four assists. Um, that, that was the Beverly you want at point guard. And, you know, when he played, you know, they were minus six in 34 minutes, which was one of the better plus minuses, particularly among the on the floor. So. Um, there was a clear difference between when Brax and Beverly was on the floor and when he was not. You saw that in this particular game. So I'm going to give him my game ball. I think that's a good pick. And of course, you got to add in there that he becomes the fifth player in program history to make 200 three pointers. I think he's within reach um, by the end of this year. If he keeps knocking down some shots from the perimeter, he could even get as high as third all time. He's not going to catch Rodney Monroe, and he's not going to catch Scott Wood. Um, but he could up, crawl up there to number three all time, could make a lasting impact on the Wolfpack um, in the record books in that regard. I'm very tempted to give my game ball to Devin Daniels, who led the team with 21 points, was pretty efficient from the field, three of five from three. Some of those threes were at big moments that kept the pack in the game. But I'm going to give my game ball to Manny Bates. Um, coming off an ankle sprain, you know, he was a question mark entering this game. I think if he didn't play, it would have been a much more lopsided loss. If you lose a Manny Bates in the paint, uh, that that points in the paint discrepancy could have been 80 to 40 versus 48 to 40 without a Manny Bates in there blocking seven shots. He was a huge presence on defense um, in a game that NC State, you know, really needed some help on defense. Still wasn't enough to win the game, but nonetheless, very impressive. Seven block performance, 10 points in 30 minutes. Um, six rebounds, second most on the team behind Jericho Hellams is seven. Um, but, yeah, I'll give it to Manny Bates. Um, good on him for getting ready for the game, probably fighting through some pain a little bit too. Can't. He said he didn't feel 100% in that first half, but once he got into the thick of the game, around halftime, he started really feeling okay. So hopefully Manny is feeling good moving forward and that he can stay in the lineup. But, yeah. Um, but, yep, that's my game ball. Manny Bates and Braxton Beverly, both the two guys that end up in the record books um, from this performance. So um, we will be back with another post-game reflections podcast after NC State's home game, scheduled home game, against Wake Forest this upcoming Wednesday at 8 p.m. You can watch that on ACC Network. Um, please be sure to follow us on social media. Um, before you close out this podcast, you can follow us on Twitter at the Wolfpacker. You can follow me personally at Justin H. Will. Give us a like on Facebook, NC State Wolfpack on the Wolfpacker.com. And of course, while you're on the Wolfpacker.com, please be sure to use that promo code PAC60. That's promo code PAC60 for a free 60 day trial on all of our premium content, news, and analysis. So for Matt Carter, this is Justin Williams, and this has been the Wolfpacker Podcast. <laughs>